I want to welcome Agile XRM to the podcast. I've known the people at Agile XRM for the past 12 years. I've seen how their business process management tool can add massive value to complex organizational processes in sectors such as finance and government. If you have complex processes or a need for dialogues on the Power Platform or Dynamics 365, take a look at how this BPM tool can add value. You can find them at agilexrm.com or check out the show notes for more details. Welcome to the Power 365 show, where I interview staff at Microsoft across the Power Platform and Dynamics 365 technology stack. I hope you'll find this podcast educational and inspire you to do more with this great technology. Now, let's get on with the show. Today's guest is from Washington in the United States. He's a senior program manager at Microsoft. You can find links to his bio, etc. in the show notes for this episode. He originally comes from New Zealand. Now, I say that because it's tongue-in-cheek, because you're Brazilian, aren't you, Marcel? <laughs> That's correct, Mark. I'm originally from Brazil, but, but I consider New Zealand home, so I'm glad to hear that. Ha-ha. <laughs> So you've obviously done some time in New Zealand. How did you come to end up at Microsoft in the US? Yes. Well, I like traveling. So long story short, in Brazil, I joined Microsoft originally 2011. And I'm from ERP background. Mm-hmm. So I always worked with ERP development as a software developer. And I joined Microsoft to do the localization for a product called Dynamics AX in Brazil. So I did that for two years. Then 2013, I wanted to go to Europe, and I went to work for a couple of partners in Europe. And eventually, in 2014, I arrived in New Zealand, basically because my wife and I, we were looking for a place where we could call home, where English would be the first language, and a country where we could have kids. And we chose New Zealand, and no regrets at all. We had a great time there. Wow, wow, wow. (laughs) And so then, how did you, you obviously, you're in New Zealand for a while. I see your name on some of the great projects that happened over here. How did you end up, how did, you know, how did your career journey take you back into Microsoft and specifically in Seattle? Yeah. So in New Zealand, I was working originally for Farmlands, mm-hmm. which is a company in the South Island. And they had, uh, they have a nice story about uh, Dynamics implementation. So I helped them to define the future uh, for, their, for their digital transformation as a solution architect. After that, I, I worked for a couple of partners as well in Microsoft. And eventually, I got connected to someone who was working for Microsoft, and they wanted to start a position in New Zealand to help partners uh, on the finance and operations space. And that's when I joined back Microsoft. And after a couple of years, uh, actually one year in Microsoft in New Zealand, I got the opportunity to come here to Seattle. And I decided to come basically because I wanted to explore, to be part of the product, to be part of this this thing that we will talk about, which is low code, no code. So that's basically how I come here. And I have no regrets so far. I love New Zealand, but here is great as well. So how long have you been in Seattle now? I moved in 2021, June. So it's less than, uh, than a year, a wow. couple of months. Wow. <laughs> so how did you find moving during COVID to Seattle? Okay. Yeah. Moving during COVID, it was very interesting. For example, to shipping your stuff, mm-hmm. very complicated. So we just decided to sell it all and start over here fresh. Wow, good idea. But it was not as bad. It was okay. I would say it was okay. It's interesting, challenging, but it's, 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 it's good to go back to normal. Yeah, yeah. Kind of. Let's talk about fusion development. I know this is an area that you're very passionate about. And it's I'm finding the more customers I engage with, there tends to be a lot of confusion around it and and Correct. and and i suppose i'll just give you some some of the premise i i i was recently involved in a large implementation well i call it large 22000 power app seats for a public uh, sector agency in australia and the the big problem that i see you know when anybody's doing large projects is resourcing right and and i feel that the partner ecosystem and the model partners work even now in supporting a customer is evolving over you know my 20 odd years in this space what i'm seeing is that rather than a partner doing a massive implementation and then walking away or putting an ams agreement in place 
what happens is more and more companies now, if they're adopting the platform as part of their digital transformation strategy, they are wanting to have a headcount of skill inside their business, right? But one of the things I'm noticing is that the only way they think to do this is to go outside their organization and hire somebody with 10 plus years experience. And of course, the Power Platform, as we know it, has not been around 10 years. And so, you know, they're struggling and specifically in a PubSec agency, you've got to have citizen resources because they need to be um, cleared from a security perspective. And so they'll only do that on citizens within the country. And so, and what I'm, you know, I often have these conversations is that, hey, you need to develop skill from within the ranks of your organization, right? You need to be finding the subject matter experts, getting them up to low code. And they're like, oh, we love the power platform, but we don't want to touch the low code. We don't want anybody just, and I'm like, well, you're, you're missing the full put, this full picture here. You're missing the full way to create a model where you can sustain and not run out of resources to help you build your applications. So when you talk about fusion teams, how do you explain it? And what are the moving parts, particularly not from a developer area, because we'll get into that in a moment, but from a business outcomes objective? Yeah, that, that's a very interesting question. And, th and here's the thing, like fusion development or fusion teams is not something that we created. It's just a term that actually describes something which is happening in the market. So actually, the first time uh, someone used this term, it was actually Gardner who defines this term. Mm -hmm. And he defines fusion development as distributed and multidisciplinary digital business teams that blend technology and other types of domain expertise. Mm -hmm. So again, it's just a way of describing something which is happening. It is happening anyway. You can call fusion development or you cannot call fusion development. And that's okay. Some people don't like. From pragmatic point of view, the, the way I like to define fusion development, it is extended low-code solutions with first-code components, mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. This is a very pragmatic from developer point of view, which usually uh, in, in the team where I am today, it is the perspective that I, I, I look. I look after the pro-developer team in that, in that context. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you, a, if, if you were looking at fusion teams from a company perspective, what would, you know, what would we consider a mix of that team to look like and how would you define or, or how would you encourage a company to, to think about developing their resource in that respect? The, the main goal in fusion development is scaling the application development, basically. Yeah. Okay? So as you said, it is, it is, a, it is a demand problem. Mm -hmm. It's hard to hire new developers. We don't have people with that time of, of experience working. We need to do something. We need to do something. The market needs new developers. And it's not only that. It is about empowering as well every organization on the planet to achieve more. Mm -hmm. And uh, sits in developers as well. So who, who, who knows better about the company usually is what we call sits in developers. Mm -hmm. So what a sits in developer is... Is usually a business user. He knows a lot about the business process and he has a clear idea about how to improve a process mm -hmm, or he has mm -hmm. a specific need, like I need an app for this process or I need to automate this process. So how can we, how can we empower this user to achieve that? Does he need a developer? Does he need a tool for that? So that, that, that's mainly the, the, the need yeah. for fusion development. Yeah, okay? yeah. So, so you know, we, we've looked at citizen developer and they're one in a continuum of developer skills. What are the other then, if we expand out a fusion team beyond citizen developer, what are the other type of roles that you see that would make up a very robust, scalable fusion team? Good question. So again, I, I might... I might focus a lot in the pro developer. Let me know if I go out of this scope. But usually we have the citizen developer as the business user, mm -hmm. and we have a professional developer. And the professional developer, usually we classify in three personas. This is how we classify. We classify as an IT or DevOps engineer. Mm -hmm. We classify as a front-end developer or as a back-end developer. And mm -hmm. I, will, I will quickly define each one of these personas. They might be different people in this team, they might be the same, okay? So the front-end developer is the person responsible for the, 
for the look and feel of the applications, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So he can be building UIs, he can be building uh, web controls, th this kind of thing. The backend developer is the guy who built APIs or he has responsibility over the data, where I store this data, how do I model this data? So this is the backend developer. And uh, the, the DevOps engineer or the IT admin is the person responsible for you to deploy that and to maintain as well. He keeps the application running in production. He defines which environment it is and how do you move from uh, dev to test to production. So these three personas in the developer, they are important. We talked about the citizen developer as mm -hmm, well. Mm -hmm. And it's important uh, also someone with a view of project management skills, uh, how to facilitate the collaboration. Okay? The important here, we are not trying to make Seats and developers, code first developers. Correct. And also, we are not trying to make code first developers, seats and developers. We want them to collaborate mm -hmm. and do, we want to meet them where they are. That, that's basically how do we see. We yeah. don't want to change. Make, yeah, totally makes sense. So, you've mentioned now a couple of times the word collaborate. And so, tell me about the tools around things like the Power Platform, Visual Studio, GitHub, Azure. What tools are Microsoft providing that allow collaboration between really four different developer personas, right? Citizen developer, IT, DevOps uh, developer, the front end and the back end developers. What's the collaboration frameworks that you're putting in, sp in place across those assets like Power Platform, Visual Studio, GitHub and Azure? Yeah, that, that's a very good question because a very common assumption uh, when mainly a developer, for example, I interact a lot with developers and I am a mm -hmm. developer myself. When they see low code, no code, they think, oh, but I don't want to stop coding. But mm -hmm. hey, hang on. We don't want you to stop coding. Definitely. No, keep coding, please. We need you. So we do have our main tool is really our VS Code integration. Mm -hmm. okay? mm -hmm. VS Code integration, uh, you can do front front end developer, back end development and also IT or DevOps. Mm -hmm. And uh, what supports this is a tool that we call PEC CLI. Okay? And PEC CLI is basically a command line interface. It is a common interface for the developers to interact with the components of a power platform. Okay? So again, VS Code e extension is the key, but uh, we have also, an, an, we, we, we don't want to dictate what tool do you want to use. If you use Azure DevOps, we do have built tasks specifically for, for Azure DevOps for you to keep your CI CD there. Uh, if you use uh, GitHub, mm -hmm. we have uh, GitHub Actions where you can automate all your workflows. And also you can abstract lots of complicated tasks. And let me give you a concrete example of that. You asked about collaboration. And as I said, we don't want to make seats and developers developers. Seats and developers, they usually, they don't know what is a source control. They don't know what is a check-in. They don't know what is a pull request. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. They don't need to know. But we need the developer, the pro developer, to, to build a safe-to-fail environment where the citizen developer, they can explore, they can build their applications, and they can fit in the process under the hoods. And GitHub Actions is a way for you to do that. We have, uh, we have a COE toolkit, for mm -hmm. example, mm -hmm. which facilitates this collaboration. And there are multiple ways for you to abstract all these complicated concepts to, to, the, to the seats and that. And what else? We also have Visual Studio integration for, for developers who build APIs, for example. You can publish your APIs in a Azure function. You can use API management as a gateway, and you can create a connector with one click in Azure portal. Mm -hmm. um, we are always looking after this experience. We don't want the developer to leave their development environment. We want the developer to be there. Another thing that you can see even in the build, we, we, we just uh, did an announcement in build, which is custom connectors, which is a way for you to connect your APIs. You can use these now as a code first control. So developers can use through our VS Code extension, our PEC CLI to interact with, with Power Platform as well without the need of leaving their development environment. So we have, we have too many tools, lots of tools and ways to integrate Power Platform. Are you coming across any, and you know, you don't need to mention any names specifically, but anybody, you know, out in the community that is doing this as well, it's getting these teams framed up well, 
using the full advantage of the collaboration tools that Microsoft is providing here. Do you have any kind of use cases where it's working well? We have a couple of, yes, we have a couple of. there, And, and this is, this is where, what is interesting. Everyone has their own way of doing things. Mm, mm. Okay? So, for example, I mentioned that we have integration specifically with Azure DevOps and also GitHub. There are some people using different tools and they are using Tech CLI to automate their processes, their CI, CD, and, mm-hmm. and, and, it, and it is working well. We have some uh, we have some cases where only professional developers are using, which that's fine as well. They find, for example, if you have a team, they they don't focus really in the UI. They want a quick way for them to expose the APIs that they have. Mm-hmm. Our platform is fantastic for that because you can very very easily build a, a UI and just publish your uh, APIs or as custom connectors and and build your application. Really really simple. In the ERP world, for example, is always very expensive. If you want to customize anything, Power Apps is a fantastic way for you to create very simple applications and not high cost and very, very effective. And you still have, have all the governance, all the controls, all the ALM processes. So again, not only one way of doing this, there is no right way, there is no wrong way. The important thing it is to find the best way to collaborate and uh, to make everybody welcome if they want to contribute. Yeah, I like it. What resources do you recommend that people, if they want to explore one, uh, you know, using Fusion Teams and Fusion Development and 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 really understanding this properly and and applying the various tools, what resources do you recommend they look at? Yes, we do have. We are creating documentation for mm-hmm. developers who are not familiar to the platform. And the link for that is aka.ms slash power dev. Okay? Power dev. Yep. Yep. Yes. aka.ms slash power dev. So mm-hmm. this is documentation for any developer, professional developer, or we call code first developer. Mm-hmm. So you can understand what are the extension points and uh, how to get familiar, how to extend the platform. We also have aka.ms slash Fusion Dev. That's an mm-hmm. uh, ebook for Azure developers. It goes a step-by-step for you to create a Fusion story and gives more deep example on what Fusion development is. Mm-hmm. And uh, also aka.ms slash Fusion Development. That's e-learning content on that. Excellent. Okay, that's a that's a great uh, lot of resources. In closing out, is there anything you'd like to add? Uh, yes, just one thing. Uh, also, lots of people ask about license. We have a plan called a developer plan. So in these documentations that I found, you can find and you can try for free. Uh, the developer plan has no limitations at all for you to using test and development environment. So go ahead and also give your feedback for us. I would be keen to hear new use cases and uh, interact with professional developers. And yeah, that's it. I like it. I like it. Marcel, thank you so much for coming on the show. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Always good to talk to New Zealand. Hey, thanks for listening. I'm your host, business application MVP, Mark Smith, otherwise known as the MZ365 guy. If there's a guest you'd like to see on the show from Microsoft, please message me on LinkedIn. If you want to be a supporter of the show, please check out buymeacoffee.com forward slash NZ365 guy. How will you create on the Power Platform today? Ciao.